Coming up on Tech Thing, Wallabot 3D Imaging in your hand, people. Dell XPS 13 Developers Edition, Factory Linux, InPass H.265 on the Pi, and more. It's all coming up on Tech Thing. If you get something useful out of this episode of Tech Thing, please consider contributing to the show at patreon.com slash techthing. We're brought to you by viewers just like you. Thank you so much. I'm Shannon Morse. And I'm Patty Norton. And this is Tech Thing, where we make technology behave. At least on the good days. I hope today is a good day. Outside of the occasional HDMI adapter today, it is looking to be a good day. <laughs> I think it is. I think it is. We actually have a pretty interesting topic to start out with. Bleeding edge. Yeah, yeah. So a few years ago, you might remember when FLIR came out and then Seek Thermal came out with adapters that allowed your phone to measure and create images from thermal energy. Uh, 250 bucks sounds like it could be a lot of money, but it's an order of magnitude less than 25 hundred dollars for similar tech that is usually used for you right. know, businesses and stuff like well, that nature. It was, it was crazy, right? So, you know, this is a, the, the kind of the front cover of FLIR's webpage and, yeah. okay, this is a cell phone and that is a thermal image on the cell phone. And that may not look like much, but that was a $2,500 to $4,000 device people used to carry right. around and to. Nowadays, people can use these for homes insulation. You can detect coyotes that are around your fence line or like my mom does, deer, <laughs> or people in the distance. That became a lot lot more affordable nowadays. Yeah. And it's been interesting. So uh, a company called Vyar Technologies has launched Wallabot, which is this thing. Wallabot. Which is 3D sensor technology based on RF imaging. Um, it was first built, the technology, they kind of were like, you know, can we detect breast cancer? Can oh, we detect cool. tumors? Uh, and it's now available. You can run it through your phone or your Windows machine. Is it x-ray vision to see through your walls? Kind of. But first up, it's not x-rays, but ultra-wide band, like 3.3 gigahertz to 10.3 gigahertz radio signals in the US, 6.3 to 8.3 gigahertz in the EU. Uh, the Wallabot essentially sends out radio waves, waits for them to bounce back, and then creates a 3D image from them. Oh. So it's not gonna see through steel or concrete, because RF won't go through that, but drywall, detecting the changing density of a chest cavity to monitor breathing, that it can do. That's uh, cool. Yeah, it does it with very, very low amounts of energy, 25 microwatts, uh, which Wallabot says is roughly 100 times less than what's coming out of your phone. So let's talk about the hardware, 149 to $599, works uh, with Android or Windows via a USB or OTG cable. It's a pretty large range. It is a pretty large range, and there's a lot going on. Um, right here, this is the starter edition, which is $149. Um, you know, three antenna array on a bare board. Uh, it can do like their radar API, their breathing API, so range measurement or motion detection. Um, when you step things up, you get to the next level, uh, which is the Maker. That's uh, $299, but it goes from three antenna arrays to 15 antenna arrays wow. on that bare board. More spatial sensing capabilities. Uh, it'll do radar mode for 2D tracking and monitoring, people tracking, distance and depth measurement. And then the one I'm holding in my hand right now is the $599 Pro version, which has 18 antennas, uh, a magnetic case uh, with a little steel disc to stick it to your phone. Um, and then uh, it gets more frequencies in the US. Uh, there's an imaging API. It'll look at raw signal data, quote, see-through walls, Android application. Um, and that's actually pretty crazy. Wallabot's fully in kind of the street finds its own uses for things. Thank you, Mr. Gibson, uh, mode for this. <laughs> and they're really targeting makers because you yeah. essentially get functioning hardware, um, access to the SDK and some very, very basic apps for Windows or Android. And this is the pro board we're looking at right here. And you can see um, the antenna arrays. Um, and on the back side, there's essentially a Viar's chip. Um, you know, we show it to you running on Windows because we didn't have an Android phone on the approved list of models, which is like an Xperia Z1, Moto Yeah, X, mine definitely d a died. A bunch of Samsung. <laughs> yeah, like literally like it died upon contact, uh, upon contact with the phone, the application. Um, you can get information on which phones are approved or tested to run with it. Uh, the software basically crashed on our phone. Um, but inside that case, right, so the case opens up and you have a board, duh. Mm -hmm. um, so the Viar 2401 A3 system on a chip integrated circuit, a Cypress USB controller on one side and then the antenna array is on the other one. Um, it's got two USB uh, ports on it. One's for the signal and the other one's basically to add additional power. Oh. Uh, you can set up a jumper for that. I think if we tweak with the jumpers on this and add external power, we might be able to get it to run <laughs> with your phone. Maybe. Might. It consumes like 0.4 to 0.9 amps, uh, according to the website, which seems okay. a little high, yeah. but uh, that would also explain the need for the Port. That's um, a lot of antennas, though. That's a lot. Yeah, this is like this is a, a lot, lot of antennas. Yeah, well, it's 25 microwatts, not that much power, but it is really crazy, right? So it's literally sending like high frequency energy out. 
uh, RF energy out and then yeah. listening and then it starts putting together an image. And it's radio waves, so it's it's not X-ray. It's safe. No, yes, exactly. <laughs> it's very very low power radio. Um, the SDK is super bare bones, uh, and and I would go so far as to call it very beta. <laughs> I had the most success using the breathing monitoring, which you're looking at right now, because as you as you, it's essentially detecting the changing density of my chest cavity. That's which, really cool. If you've ever stared at your beta bee going, is it SIDS or is it alive? Uh, and if you're not a parent, that probably won't make nearly as much sense to you as it does to the people going like, yeah, I was there, man. I had the mirror over the baby's mouth. Um, but you get some very basic low-res information. For example, here's me kind of detecting Shannon uh, and looking at the information of a Shannon shape in the distance. Uh, and then it, it basically converts it to an image. It works, but it's very, very raw. It's pretty crazy, right? Because it's basically, in, in this case, measuring density. So their theory is like people could use it to detect water leaks because uh, it's denser or termite damage or oh. moving termites in a wall. That's a good point. Um, yeah, and, and they're basically offering the tools to access this to see what people create. It's fairly short range. Wallabot told me it depends on the size of the object you're trying to detect, but quote, put it on the bumper of a car with the antenna facing the right way, uh, and it'll detect a pedestrian at 30 feet. Oh, cool. So. This is interesting. I'm going to give it a thumbs up, yeah. but I think everybody okay. needs to understand, you know, this is not nearly as ready for prime time uh, as all those thermal, thermal imaging hardware was yeah. when it came out a few years ago. It's much more bleeding edge tech wise. Uh, and while you could drop $600 to search for water pipes or termites, uh, you may have to build your own application to do that. Gotcha. Um, you know, Wallabot, uh, Viar, see this is something that will be deployed by makers in the new areas. They were really excited about the idea of putting them on drones or RV devices or robots or the front mm. of your car. Although with a 30 foot range on this, I'd say it's probably more <laughs> useful for not running over kids behind you in yeah, a parking lot or I your driveway. It sounds like it's got a lot of potential. It is bleeding edge technology. Um, it's not going to see through concrete, it's not going to see through steel, um, but I'm curious to see what people kind of come up with. If they're, they're at Maker Faire this year. Uh, I was not at Maker Faire this year, um, although I was building in my backyard, which I think kind <laughs> of, of yeah, I was building playground equipment, which gets really out of control really quickly. Yeah. Um, interesting idea. Mm -hmm. uh, Wallbot.com is the website. Go check it out, and cool. uh, if you see something interesting, uh, let us know about it. Yeah, absolutely. And P.S. I did want to remind everybody, uh, you can still vote for Hack 5, which is Tech Thing's sister show. Uh, I'm also on that show if you haven't ever seen it before, hak5.org. But we're up for an award. Uh, you can go over to Hatting the Systems website. It's hat.t2t2.eu, and it gives you the entire list of what you need to do to vote for all these really cool podcasts. Um, we're kind of part of a club here with all these podcasts, so we really appreciate that they've nominated us and um, I don't know maybe we'll win an award so hat.t2t2.eu and of course you can always email us with your favorite choices and interesting things like the wallabot over at feedback at I mean ask at techthing.com I was thinking about hack five you were thinking about hack five I was come back to tech thing <laughs> come back award chaser <laughs> <laughs> vote for her I voted you can vote every day we want to thank everybody that contributes to the show via patreon.com slash tech thing. You, you make it possible for Shannon and I to bring you tech thing week after week. All our patrons get access to our patron only builds. We're going nuts on a main cabinet arcade build in June and July and contributing at higher levels. Get your name on the website, in the credits, even monthly hangouts with Shannon and I. Please keep sending us your questions and tips. Thank you so much for supporting tech thing, no matter how you do it. We got an email from Angry Mosfet who wrote Mosfet. 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 Who wrote, Hi guys, <laughs> my Samsung Smart TV does not support X265 codec, which is gaining popularity recently, so I thought of adding a Raspberry Pi 3 for that purpose. Hence my question, is this tiny thing able to play back 1080p high bitrate Blu-ray rips in X265? I'm not sure what the deal is with this codec. I hear something about hardware compatibility, but that's about it. Those things are quite pricey where I live, so I don't want to have buyer's remorse afterwards. Many thanks and much obliged from Angry MOSFET. Angry MOSFET. Transistors of Rage! <laughs> Sorry. Um, I so love that name. <laughs> it is awesome. Uh, short answer, high efficiency video coding, uh, HEVC, uh, aka H.265, compresses video tighter uh, at a cost. The goal is to get 4K video looking good in the same bandwidth as the 1080p video. I hope that wow. didn't sound too horrible over your speakers. <laughs> um, 
That means 1080p and H.265 should be much smaller than H.264, which you might notice is why it's showing up on the interwebs if you're downloading things, but it's much more computationally intense to unpack for the same bit rate i.e. you need to throw more CPU on it. Um, okay. You probably won't notice that on 4K or H.265 ready gear because the decoding is almost always done by a dedicated chip somewhere or a part of a video chip that is dedicated to H.265 decoding, not by the CPU. Example, Apple TV has an H.265 HEVC uh, chip or hardware in the fourth gen Apple TV, uh, though as far as I know, there's no API access to it for developers. So H.265 encoded 1080p video in say an MKV container probably stutters on an Apple TV but if you take the same video and re-render it into H.264, it runs fine. Huh. Okay, so my understanding is that there's dedicated H.264 decoding on the Pi 3, uh, but not uh, full H.265 decoding. Uh, so that the Pi should be able to do, they say the Pi 3 can do 1080p at 30 frames per second for H.265 um, with optimization, so you get the latest Kodi builds. Mm. Um, the OSMC crew think Debian and Kodi for the Pi said this about the Pi 3, the new quad-core CPU will bring smoother, gooey performance. There have also been recent improvements to H.265 decoding. While not hardware accelerated on the Raspberry Pi, the new CPU will enable more H.265 content to be played back on the Raspberry Pi than before. Okay. So here's my thought. If Pi boards are expensive, Pi boards, Pi boards. Pi boards. Pi boards. Boston. The cat's caucus is under the Pi board. <laughs> um, if Pi boards are expensive where you live, I'd look for something that definitely does solid H.265. For example, the Odroid C2 has H.265 uh, 4K 60 frames per second and H.264 4K 30 frames per second uh, capabilities in the VPU. The Roku 4 obviously does H.265 record or de yep. recording, decoding. Decoding. Decoding, because uh, it's built for 4K. Uh, or you could have a Plex server transcode your H.265 video on the fly. But that, that would take a lot. Well, yeah, it's very resource intensive for the Plex server. Yeah. So if you have your Plex server running on sort of a low end NAS, probably not going to work. If yep. you've got it running on a desktop, it'll probably work fine as long as you don't want to play video games at the same time. Um, that's pretty much everything I know about H.265 and the Raspberry Pi 3 and other small boxes. Um, you know, some people are saying they're having, you know, good quality experiences with H.265. Uh, you know, on some of the, the Google streamers and stuff. If you have information, and I know a lot of you do, do us a favor, email us, askatechthing.com, because I can't check H.265 on all of the things, <laughs> because I don't have all of the things. <laughs> but all of you have nearly all of the things. And uh, if you've been playing with H.265, we would love to hear about what you have to say. Should we read another email? I think so. Okay. So our next one is from Fred, who writes, big fan of the shows. I am about to change over my laptop to Linux after the school year. I'm going to use Zubuntu as my OS, but I realize Google Drive has no Linux support. What can I do if I have 200 gigabytes of free storage for two years of Google Drive and I would like to keep using it? What would be the best free unofficial Google Drive method to use from Fred? Oh boy. Couldn't he just use it in, in the browser? That would be the easiest way to do it, is just use it in the That's browser. That's what I do. Yeah, uh, and it's weird, right? Because my understanding is Google uh, runs a ton of, of Linux on desktops internally and yeah. has a G Drive compatible Linux tool they use internally. I think it's weird that they don't officially offer one for use outside of the campus. What? Yeah, <laughs> you have options. Like Shannon said, just use drive.google.com and you know work through the web browser. There are unofficial drive clients for Linux, like uh, InSync, Rclone, G Drive, uh, or Drive. And uh, props to maketechesier.com slash google-drive-clients-linux for giving us the heads up <laughs> on those. Um, you could also uh, go with uh, your buddy's website. Oh, uh, yeah. Spider Oak. Yeah, Spider Oak. Spider Oak. Yeah. Um, Spider Oak is all about Linux support. Uh, Barracuda had copy uh, up until a few weeks ago. Copy is now gone. Um, the vast majority of them are not particularly worried about Linux because the vast majority of people doing users, users are on Windows or OS X. Yep. So those are some examples. Uh, <laughs> if, you, if you got some cloud storage suggestions for Linux users, email askatechthing.com. But you know, Spider Oak. Shannon knows the crew. It's a good one. They do security. They like Linux. Zero knowledge. Uh, but that's not the, yeah. That's also, I also understand, like, I have 200 gigabytes and I want to use it for yeah. all two years. Oh, yeah. Just remember, you, you need an exit strategy for the end of that two years. <laughs> and it takes a while to download 200 gigabytes. Patrick over here reviewed the newest Dell XPS 13 laptop way back in January of this year, and he gave it 
Tons of praise. I would say that you liked it. It's pretty badass. <laughs> it's a great screen, excellent battery life, yeah. good build quality. You have it right here still. Um, so you're right still now. using it, like it. Dell's line of XPS laptops, they run Windows for consumers, but you can also purchase a developer edition from the same line that comes pre-installed with Ubuntu 14.04, which is what I'm running on this one. What? And yes, that is 14.04. It's not the newest LTS, which is 16.04 <laughs> that just dropped in April, but this was announced in March, so that right. kind of makes sense. You can always upgrade though. It's very easy to upgrade through Linux. It's not an issue. So these are developer edition laptops. They do come with most to the same exact specs mm -hmm. as the original XPS 13 editions do. Uh, so I won't go over all of those since you've already heard them, but what I will mention with this is the fact that developer edition comes with up to 16 gigs of RAM, nice. which is a nice little upgrade as opposed to eight gigabytes mm -hmm. of RAM. And it also comes with a one terabyte solid state drive nice. up to one terabyte solid state drive. So the one that I am using currently is a 512 gig solid state drive and it has an i7 6560 U CPU. Very nice. Now, along with that, of course, comes the hefty price tag for these. They're a little bit more expensive. Don't freak out. <laughs> I don't think it's that expensive. I mean, they're it's starting not at that $1, expensive $1, when compared to other Ultrabooks on the market. Right. I mean, for example, Razer has ones that are up in the two grands too, uh, but their most recent one right. was a lot cheaper. However, the one that I'm running is this one right here, the new XPS 13 Developer Edition for $2079. So that's $2,000, $79.99. If you want that one terabyte solid state drive, you have to put down about $2,500. So it is a little pricey, but again, this is for developers. Right. Uh, the 16 gig RAM will help with processes like you know doing rendering and doing test applications, as well as the CPU too. Right. The nice new sixth generation CPU. Oh, that's, that's sexy. A big part of that cost is the Core i7 processor. Absolutely. Yeah. And the 16 gigabytes of RAM. Yes. And a one terabyte drive. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> that starts to, you know, a couple hundred here, a couple hundred there. Right. Suddenly, and not to 600 mention, bucks up. It's also touchscreen, and it's also just as useful as the previous touchscreens have been. So Dell's been really, really good about those on these Dell XPS 13 uh, machines. But of course, you can save a little bit of money too if you don't need a touchscreen. You can always buy right. one of the cheaper editions as well. Uh, so one of the things that I'm loving about this machine is that everything just works. That's a big deal if you've ever configured Linux on a laptop and yes. had, maybe the audio didn't work. Maybe yes. for some reason the, the touchpad misbehaved yes. or you couldn't. <laughs> so every, I mean, and it's, it sounds stupid, but everything works out of the box. Yeah. Wi-Fi. There's battery Great. management. Battery is mm -hmm. managed in here. Uh, you can get battery lasting around eight hours or that's so. Good. I was able to get it la to last a little bit longer, but that's because I wasn't using it r really heavily. Right. But eight hours. So you get a full work day, which is awesome. <laughs> <laughs> but Wi-Fi works out of the out of the box. This one I had to pre-configure the Wi-Fi to actually get it working on my Linux uh, machine. My day-to-day -day laptop is running Ubuntu. I have had a few issues that I've run into, such as the Wi-Fi, such as the battery. So it's really nice to have a machine that just boots up and when, have when it work. When Shannon eloquently says issues, what she means to say is I spent hours digging through drivers and information yeah. on the web to make <laughs> this function so I could connect to the delete X of internet. So I think <laughs> the moral of this story <laughs> is while I'm not going to go into the specs of this, do you want to spend more money and get a pre-configured mm -hmm. ready-to-go laptop for a developer or turn your own laptop into an Ubuntu machine right. and quite possibly have to deal with a lot of those configuration issues that are going to come up. Um, it's really, really nice to be able to just boot up a machine and have it work. <laughs> I bought Linux. it and it ran yeah. instead of I bought it and then I fooled around for five days <laughs> and most of the stuff ran, but the audio sounds Exactly, funny. and then your warranty is no longer in place because you installed Linux on your operating system instead of Windows 10. On the other side, there's no shovelware on your machine, you? <laughs> or except what got installed with your Linux distro. But yeah. I, I don't think that for, 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 for a Core i7 laptop with 16 gigabytes of RAM uh, and a fast uh, uh, SSD or like NVMe SSD. It's a good price. It's a good price. The, yeah. the NVMe SSDs are also stupid fast and a little right. bit more expensive than regular SATA SSDs. Um, yeah. It's very nice. 
It's very, very nice. I have a lot of friends who work in Linux mm -hmm. um, in the IT field or in InfoSec, and a lot yeah. of them have had issues with their previous laptops uh, whenever they have to install their own version of you know, Ubuntu or uh, Arch Linux or whatever right. they might use. So in their cases, especially for one who recently was on a phone call with Razer, and Razer's answer to his issue was, well, you should probably just reinstall Windows 10. No. <laughs> he wanted to use Linux, make it work. Give me the drivers. But that's so, it, though. And that's the pro tip with this is, yeah. like, it works. Well, that's one of the challenges <laughs> with, with, especially with, like, graphics adapters inside of laptops yep. is it's kind of like the operating system for an Android phone. Yep. You may not be able to actually download the drivers directly. You may have to get them from the notebook manufacturer. Very and true. if the notebook manufacturer does not give a squat about Linux, um, <laughs> you have to get creative in figuring out how to get your your, your drivers running, oh, which is so, so frustrating. <laughs> so, so thumbs up? Thumbs up, absolutely. I had a lot of fun being able to play with this, and I'm hoping that I can keep it for another week or so, just so I can really dig in and, mm -hmm. you know, tr try some rendering and things like that. And then if I have any updates, of course, I'll share those on the <laughs> show. But so far, I've really, really enjoyed it. And of course, if you guys have questions about the XPS 13 or any laptops in general, as far as like what we would purchase, you can always email us, ask at techthing.com. There is an amazing new laptop coming out from a manufacturer I can't name in <laughs> August, but I'm so excited to tell you about it. <laughs> NDA, man. I don't want the lawyers, the attack lawyers were dropped <laughs> from the ceiling and beat me with chains. <laughs> well, I'll have to be patient. In response to our password manager episode, which was super fun, by the way. Yes. I loved that episode. Jeff emailed, hey, tech thing, I wanted to also suggest NPass. It Ooh. stores local only, but supports encrypted syncing with every major cloud service. It also does password generation, has fields and categories for absolutely Ooh. everything, is customizable, and has browser plugins for major browsers. The desktop app is free. Mobile apps are about 10 bucks. No subscription fees, and it works in Linux, Windows, OS 10, Android, iOS, Windows Phone, BlackBerry, and probably more. On Android, it even supports Nexus imprints, so you can unlock it with your fingerprint on your supported mobile device. I use it for my personal and business accounts. The browser plugins work most of the time, depending on how the website in question was set up. On some of my crappy bank and loan service servicer websites, it doesn't autofill properly. Same with LastPass for myself too, Jeff. It does still have a time bomb copy to clipboard feature though, when autofill doesn't work. Thanks for doing what you do as an IT consultant. I really appreciate what you do for users that wouldn't be as educated. Reminds me of the old ZDTV CFH SS days from Jeff. The uh, call for screen help and screensavers. Savers. Oh yeah. When I was a child, I definitely watched call for help and screensavers. That's so. If funny. I could find them online, in front of them. <laughs> it was Sorry, hard to I find them online back then. your show. <laughs> it's all good. <laughs> As long yeah. as you watch the ads. And pass is very cool. It's also very, very inexpensive. If you take a look at the, uh, the pricing information on that, uh, it's free for the desktop on Windows, Linux, and Mac, and free for up to 20 items on mobile. Wow. Uh, or a $10 license, lifetime license per platform. So yeah, that's a great price. I, I haven't gotten to play with NPass yet, but it sounds like a really, really great competitor. So thank you so much, Jeff, for offering your advice with that password manager. Really appreciate it. And a very stylish interface. A very stylish interface. <laughs> I like stylish interfaces. Won't lie. It's very important to me that it's easy to use, it's customizable, and it's feature rich. As long as I can actually find the stuff I need. Because yes. sometimes people get way too clever with UI and it takes way too long. That's true. <laughs> Once in a while, ladies and gentlemen, put down the phone, step away from the screen, close the laptop, and do something analog. Like something I did last weekend. Try what did you new try? cheese. I finally got a chance to try Cowgirl Creamery St. Pat's. Oh. Which is their spring seasonal cheese. Yum. Yes. Cowgirl Creamery is amazing. A distinctive green rind that commemorates the arrival of spring in Marin County. Made from John Taverna's Chileno Valley Jersey Dairy, these rich creamy wheels are wrapped in wild nettle <laughs> leaves harvested by the Fresh Run Farm in Bolinas. The nettle wow. leaves which are frozen to remove the sting impart a light smoky artichoke flavor. Ooh, flavor. That sounds good. It's actually really, really good. Uh, if you like cheeses, I highly recommend cowgirlcreamery.com and congratulations to the founder who have just sold Cowgirl Creamery after oh, that's running cool. it for decades. They make... They are not a sponsor, by the way. They are not a sponsor. We just like cheese. We like cheese a lot. <laughs> we really like... Oh, where is it? It's also like lunchtime, so... <laughs> <laughs> We're hungry. Devil's Gulch is awesome. Uh, it's it's basically a, a soft cheese covered with... Uh, 
peppers. Spicy All right, peppers. so I'm gonna go eat lunch. <laughs> My name is Shannon Morse. And I'm Patrick, I love cheese Norton. <laughs> and we'll see you next week on Tech Thing. Cheese! Cool. Yeah. And saved the cheese. Yay! <laughs> oh, oh my man. goodness. I want to go find some cowgirl creamery cheese now. Thanks for bringing that up, Patrick. That's, that was one of the great things about taking the ferry into San Francisco is in the ferry plaza building, uh, there's a cowgirl creamery shop and a proud of ranch. And, uh, and the place with the tasty pink parts, which I can't remember. Really oh, I yeah. like food, hence my Savelle figure. <laughs> <laughs> Although I'm cutting it. Radically cut down on carbohydrates. Have you? Yeah. I haven't. How, how about this? Dare me to do a couch to 5K based on an application on my phone. <laughs> <laughs> okay. This, this is an actual app, couch to 5K. That's funny. I think I can run a 5K, possibly even with Tristan on my shoulders without completely destroying myself. What? I'm not going to run can't. a marathon. I can climb a mountain if there's a shrine at the end. 